Hello there. My name is Brock Davignon. I'm uh, at age 69, an interactive television network executive dealing in things like crypto coupons, which uh, I wouldn't have dreamed of. But uh, in 1976, I met a fellow named Ted Danieleski and worked uh, pretty occasionally with him, but steadily. Uh, from about 76 to 80, and from 82 to 84, uh, assisting him and him being a mentor to myself. His name was Tad Danielewski. And um, he was highly regarded in, in New York, uh, Hollywood, uh, television, motion pictures, uh, because he was a master at explaining 77 elements of dramatic form across different genres and I uh, had gotten into uh, computerizing motion picture sets at the BYU Motion Picture Studio, Brigham Young University, uh, in 76, 77 and forward and he knew what I was doing and normally he wouldn't you know have had messed with me until I was you know later on in 500 level courses but in the junior senior level but I was basically revamping the motion picture studio with separate circuits and uh, pulling computers out of the box nobody knew how to use. I'd been a programmer since 1970 in Fortran and COBOL and um, could actually read the language in various ways 10 years later and help students solve problems with what were then becoming obsolete. Uh, I was a pioneer in selling Apple IIEs and was uh, an occasional acquaintance uh, advising a fellow named Steve Jobs to, when he got kicked out, to go do Pixar. And, um, but earlier on, somebody taught me how to take advice to walk into the unknown technologically for aesthetics, uh, what's hot and what's not. Uh, semiotics, the study of symbols. Uh, this fellow here, uh, that's Ernie for percentages you earn in finance and fine insurance that figured very prominently in my life in 1976. Um, in 72, I had uh, gotten into a field uh, trying to use a percentage of income uh, for financing things and finance insurance, like in medical care for all people in the free market, um, as a charging system for various things that would cause people's income to go up and the people that sold them the tools or the education would then uh, benefit greatly. And uh, this was part of my idea of, uh, when I uh, was humorously calling it a silicon set, uh, I'd done this. So by 1983, Ted and I had worked together on the computerization of dramatic form uh, he wasn't the most organized guy, except in his brain, it was brilliant. And uh, I, I get organizational uh, when I need to. There are people that are wired into having all their socks straight in a drawer compulsively, so I'm not one of those, but I, I push myself uh, between creativity and organization to get things done. And uh, one day, Ted surprised me. He says, uh, Robert Wise, a friend of mine, is coming to see you. I was like, Robert Wise, like Ted knows everybody, so I said, are you talking about the fellow who did Sound of Music and uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still? Uh, I'm a big fan of some of his science fiction movies. And he goes, yeah, that's the one. He's got a problem, and uh, I think you can solve it for him. I went, me? <laughs> okay. And um, he says he has a problem with uh, computer graphics. Now, he had made in 1979, uh, at an era where uh, things like Disney's Tron were wireframe phosphor green on a silver screen, and they overlaid special effects on it. And Walt well, Disney had done the last great glass map movie with moving pictures of stars and so forth, and spaceships uh, for the black hole. Uh, it had 496 panels in it. And, um, so for him to tell me that Robert Wise, who I knew from my other film classes, was the 19-year-old editor of Citizens Kane, which the American Film Institute rates the best film ever, and still does, um, wanted to come see me. This was like 
wow, okay. And it was just him and me, not, not a class, not a speech, anything else, but like many times we were used to. Uh, and um, so he was gonna drop out of the sky and at least for two hours uh, run through things with me. So Ted set us up in a room in the Harris Fine Arts Center um, and uh, this was about 10 in the morning. And I, I knew a lot about him, but not the full breadth of his repertoire going back into the 1940s, but I was suitably odd. I'd seen the, the, uh, the, trap, the Von Trapp family on a black and white TV with Disney, and to compare the story with no music or color to what he did with the sound of music was awing in it of itself to know he did this. I, I stood in the rain at the Cathay Circle to see that as well as other things like my little sister uh, on um, uh, Mary Poppins and things. So it was a, a favorite theater of ours. It was very big, big screen. And this guy knew how to make big screen epics. And um, uh, I had been impressed with the Star Trek movie using the symbol of the Voyager going out in the unknown as V'ger, uh, who would come back somewhat not knowing who its parents were, creating problems for Earth. And um, the thing being the size of the solar system and a giant machine was kind of, you know, colossal and high stakes, you know, the Earth was going to get cleansed by this thing. And um, so I had no idea that was the problem he had. So he sits down and he says, uh, Ted uh, told me a bit about what you're achieving with uh, electronifying uh, movie sets, which it desperately needs for some efficiencies. And I, and I, and I think that may, you might be the guy to help me on this. He says, you've invented uh, video assist as uh, instant replay, so I don't have to do rushes and dailies for things, but that's not my problem. And uh, I go, okay, shoot. And he said, uh, I want to redo the Star Trek the movie, but I want to start planning now for 10 years from now the anticipated advances in computer graphics. And I understand that you've gotten the BYU um, design technology plant, a, a $10 million Dremel tool out of uh, the IBM and Space Shuttle Systems Group for your student development office. I could, yeah, one of my hobbies. <laughs> he laughed. And he said, um, you work with a Professor Razor and Tolman to do these things with quarter million dollar computer vision and applicon computer systems for the students and with this machine designs what they do on that. And I go, yeah, uh, it's a combination of raster graphics and vector graphics. He goes, that much I know. And um, uh, the tooling and so forth is done down in the basement. And I go, yeah. And um, he says, um, I understand that you freaked out the uh, IBM Space Shuttle Systems Group chief and their federal guy by uh, uh, showing them students from Brazil and Japan, all the people that couldn't have uh, even go into a Thiokol rocket uh, company over here because they're not US citizens, they're designing better space shuttles than, than they are. And I go, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where this was going. And um, he says, I want to redo these graphics and I want you to tell me what the benchmarks are in the movie. And he says, I gather you've seen the movie. And I go, yeah, I don't have it memorized, but yeah. And he goes, well, I kind of got a shot list here to jog our memories. He says, I don't remember everything. I go, okay. And um, it was sort of a director's script. It was marked out, as I recall. And uh, so we were talking about this and going through it. Now, if you want to see everything that he eventually did, 14 years later, not 10 years, he had finished what he did, which is in the mid-90s, and then he released it in the year 2001 as Star Trek the Movie Director's Edition. To see that, you can go to IMDB, Internet Movie Database, uh, dot com, uh, and look for alternate versions of it. And there's a long list of these. Uh, Two-thirds were his directorial improvements in terms of... Uh, computer graphics as a close-up with uh, Mr. Spock on Vulcan um, and um, doing his Colleen R thing and um, so live long and prosper. Uh, the idea of conveying ideas that he thought mattered was that uh, things have unintended consequences and um, 
So we were talking, and and um, I had uh, knew I was talking with a science fiction prime mover, much less fan, and uh, so I discussed uh, the idea of how we'd get out into space and uh, go to asteroids using the same way that America did with percentages you earn finance of so thousands of ships. America brought a million people voluntarily from uh, Britain, uh, France, Holland to America. And they were not indentured servitude uh, types at 100% labor. Uh, they were not slaves. And they were entrepreneurial farmer families of sometimes six people. And they could starve the first year, so they had finance to grub stake. They had their plows or other tools to be a craftsperson. And uh, this very expensive passage across the sea, analogous to space. And he goes, I like the way you think, kid. You know, like, okay. And um, so I had been working from uh, 1992 on this when I'd read about it in a Reason magazine uh, as for a way to finance education. And so he and I discussed uh, the death of the studio star system. And um, the idea was that uh, people were essentially indentured servants to a specific studio that trained them on how to be a great camera person or uh, actor. And then they would uh, be stuck with them. They couldn't go for those roles at other studios that would have been perfect for them. And he didn't like that, and he was very lenient with anybody he had under his control and scheduling that way. But many of the studio chiefs were not. And that system died with the advent of television, and it didn't continue. And so he says, yet yeah, there's this tremendous lack of development of people, like in the situation of computer graphics for the motion picture industry. And he says, I like what, what you're doing. And I said, well, last summer, uh, of, well, not last summer, but the, the summer of 76, I had started working with Milton Friedman, who was the guy that started this at Duke and Yale University for three tenths of 1% of your annual postgraduate income for 15 years, or 20 or 25, depending on what your thing was. And they miscalculated that they had artists on a very long payback, and not realizing they might be a Walt Disney or somebody like Robert Wise who could use computer graphics and make a great deal of money. And they made more money off of women, minorities, and artists than they did the, the businessmen and surgeons that paid a high, the same amount, but for a shorter period of time. And uh, so he says, so you do that. And, and I, I looked at him, I said, it would be fun to run a Hollywood, you know, a parody on, it would be fun to run a newspaper on Citizen King. And at that point, Ted Danieleski came in the room. He says, how are you guys doing? And uh, I says, uh, you can, uh, Ted, could you do me a favor and cancel my uh, exit plane and reschedule me for tomorrow? I'm going to stay over in Provo uh, the rest of today and tonight. I'll spend this evening with you, if that's all right with you, and uh, the rest of the day with this young fellow here. What's your name? <laughs> oh, Brock Davignon. And uh, it's a da, uh, da's in Russian and V's in victory and yo is in yo-yo. And, and he laughed, I got it. And uh, so he said, uh, uh, well, you guys hungry for lunch? And uh, he said, yeah. And he says, we could go over to the cafeteria. He says, actually, we're on a roll. I'd like to stay here. Could you get some food brought over here? And Ted said, sure. So he worked that out. And, and a couple of trays magically appeared within the hour. And we kept at it. And um, we went returned back to the Star Trek uh, shot list and would intermittently spin off on something else in terms of uh, uh, trying to get rid of nuclear weapons and, and, uh, and the strategic defense initiative. But, uh, I'd help put together the A-team for that with my Aunt Frances of McDonald and some guy named Ronnie Reagan and his speechwriter I recommended, Dana Rohrbacher and the High Frontier Foundation. And had some success with that. Uh, we were... Um, not yet at the point where we were getting treaties for um, chewing up uh, half the nuclear weapons of the U.S. and the USSR and German and French reactors. Uh, that went on for 20 years, until about 2015, uh, when uh, Putin abrogated the treaty. But uh, you know, half seas is better than destroying the world 11 times over. You can only destroy it five times over. And there's some new players in that. So we discussed uh, his message of world peace and and uh, the day the earth stood still, and, and uh, uh, that 
uh, one ways of lowering desperation or people's ambitions for what they need as well as what they want or this percentage is your finance and fight insurance. And um, we, we talked about Hollywood unions and some of their health plans and this thing and, and their retirement and so forth. And all this kind of percolated that he was interested in this uh, and was willing to diverge off of his shot list and make some time for this. So he was kind of draining my brain and I was draining his and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, the effect of that on a young person, that Tad would take a great mentor other than himself and slam you together with it, uh, had some following effects. Um, by uh, 1992, I'd started the Phone Voter Television Network uh, with satellite TV uh, and phone systems and telepoles with computers and tallies adding up and change the presidential election. And when that was over uh, in the primaries, I uh, was working as a real estate uh, fellow and a business broker, and I was trying to sell the largest 100 bonanza size ranches in the West for a real estate broker who would keep me out of trouble. And there was a fellow in the town named John David Waz, who was a broker uh, in Southern California, and my broker, Lauren Strider, was in Northern California, uh, much of where these properties were. And uh, we're talking 900 acres to 60,000 acres that they could parcelize up into lots of other ranches with everybody with a river and a valley in them. And um, I was finding that the, the security people in Hollywood made these financial decisions based on security and field of fire, not how much of a good investment it might be, but as a place to live or be. And um, all of these things were there, but you know, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. But I was up late one night. Uh, I had this strange schedule because I was running a pizza parlor, part and part of it, uh, going from network executive to running a pizza parlor. And then at night I would work at the Kinko's Copies on, on the marketing newsletters for these ranches. And in the middle of the night, um, other than uh, uh, things, there was this old man that kept coming in and he was shivering cold. And it, it was winter. And uh, so he... Uh, you know, was warming up, and then he'd go out again and come back in. So by the second, third time, you know, I, I said, are you all right? Can I help you in some way? And he says, I'm lost. And he says, uh, I wound up here. Where am I? And I said, uh, you're, you're in Temecula. And he goes, oh, okay. He says, I live over in Laguna Niguel, I said, over in the leisure world. He goes, yeah. He, he was very ancient. And he says, I can't see at night to drive. I can drive in the day, but I can't do it at night. And um, so I said, well, uh, if I drive you over there tonight, uh, could you drive me back in the day and you'll have some place to sleep instead of freezing all night? And he goes, sounds good to me. And so uh, I packed up my 10 page marketing uh, newsletter and, and drove off into the night in his Cadillac and with me at the wheel. And um, about halfway on the, way on the Ortega Highway, the old fellow, uh, asked me what I'm doing, what I'm interested in. I explained this percentage as you earn. And he says, uh, I said, what, what, what did you do for a living? And he says, well, I was the lawyer for the Warner Brothers. And I'd keep guys like Errol Flynn's sexual peccadillos out of the newspaper and try to tone things down. But these guys were always brats acting out because they were like indentured servants. They, they couldn't get out of their contracts with uh, Jack Warner and his brothers. And I go, oh. So I explained to him as we were driving along this idea I had for a studio star development system using percentages you earn where people would be free to go anywhere they wanted as long as they paid back the original studio a percentage of their action. In 1970 it was $1,000, you'd pay the three tenths of 1% uh, of your postgraduate income for 15 years. That's today $7,500 in the year 2023 for exactly the same cost value impact. Uh, was a dilute the money supply, but um, uh, the old man recognized that that would have solved all of the problems as a lawyer he had, uh, and he could even get paid as a contingency fee if he needed, but he would be needed a lot less. And um, these people would be happy going where they needed to go and seeing if that movie or TV show was their thing. So he says, pull over the car. 
and there was I, this was the narrow highway at night. I said, well, I'll have to wait to the next turnout. Well, I, I figured he might, might need to go pee or something. And so I found the turnout. He says, turn on the light. I want to see your face. And uh, so I did. And, and he says, I want you to promise me, uh, like you did Robert Wise, you're going to do this studio star system. With the percentage, sure. And I go, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And he says, that's all I want. And he says, well, drive on. And I go, okay. And so we can proceeded for the rest of the 45 minute trip over to the coast. And I had remembered this situation with Tad putting me with Robert Wise, because I mentioned that. Uh, you don't forget things like that too easy. And um, so in he had passed away not long after that, and he left me his memory pill jar uh, as a don't forget a reminder. And, uh, and so uh, I figured that uh, I'd like to go making movies or something. I wanted to use this knowledge that I gained from Tad. And I started uh, the second digital studio. Uh, the first was with Lucas, the third was with Spielberg. I had the second. And um, I didn't always choose wisely. As, uh, Lucas would say, um, uh, my partners, but uh, uh, had a strategic plan to turn big hangars, aerospace hangars in Antelope Valley into uh, sound stages, which later guys like Mel Gibson did for the flood in the middle of the Mojave Desert uh, uh, with all of the electric plugs you could possibly imagine in this place. And uh, uh, Madonna did her uh, practicing of her laser light shows and effects and so forth. But uh, this studio was designed for one plug would be for one computer, one printer. So that somebody manages to dump coffee in a toaster in the next room, you're not going to fry six weeks worth of computer graphics up against deadline and, uh, and just chalk it off. That's the way studios are supposed to be. And they don't have to be that. So I was there, uh, you know, when, when a dream begins to snowball, uh, there was a, uh, a very beautiful uh, long drink of water that uh, comes up to this warehouse that we were working out of at the time as a studio before building the digital one. And I explained what our goals were with, uh, with this. And she says, uh, that's great. She says, as an introductory customer, uh, I can give you a special offer. I said, well, gee, I, we're just starting this thing. I, I don't have that kind of money. And she says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll trade you an idea. You sound like you got some ideas. What's a good idea for me? Uh, I, I represent the Creative Industry Handbook. And I said, well, you might have noticed that there are computer geeks and people who do special effects, and there is no directory listing for them, either in your book or anybody else's, uh, Hollywood Reporters or anybody's. And uh, the directories are otherwise excellent, but they kind of miss us. And uh, she laughed and she says, okay, you got yourself a full color, uh, full page uh, cardboard ad with a tab on it for that. She says, I'll go find them all. She, I figured she knew almost everybody in Hollywood as it was. Her name was Heather Blair, who today is the head of Cinema Esports, uh, convincing theaters to use one theater for people in chairs will watch other people playing video games in somebody else's theater uh, in several places in the world at the same time. And there's more people on the standings boards with watching these games and who's winning first, second, third, and how maybe how much money they won uh, than there are people who watch the Super Bowl in a year, annually, one time. That's every minute. And so uh, she's on our board of advisors here at the Freedom Interactive Television Networks, and she too likes this. And uh, she later uh, created the Digital 411 book because I saw that, uh, going back to the problems Robert Wise was having, he didn't know who to call. He, he has Tad and Tad put him with me. And uh, that was wonderful for me, but uh, there would have been a lot more interesting people closer to him that, that might have done, done him some good. So I explained that to her, and uh, she did Digital 411, which is today Variety411.com, and you can look up uh, creativehandbook.com. And uh, she was a salesperson, and they never gave her a piece of the action on either one of those. And I'm very much an advocate for entrepreneurial activity, particularly like producers, and um, anybody else that wants to work that way, but also to reward people for 
what they've learned, what they're willing to pay, investing in themselves, in their future, on their good faith and credit. And uh, uh, Lance Williams, uh, one of Ted's students, he doesn't charge people a flat fee. He just says, I don't want your hamburger slinging money as a that model. I just, when you get paid for a model in the next three years, I get 15%. He goes, okay, yeah, that's suitable for his classes. And he's Ted Danielewski's uh, protege on running the Professional Actors Workshop, which is also a director and screenwriter's workshop, as it always has been, the paw. And um, so in terms of other things that have affected us, a charity champions network with new technology and graphics, um, the, the graphics on racing cars, everything's got a logo on it except the grass. And, Chiron Higo is calling me up to make sure that we do that so a charity can get a piece of the grass uh, if a car is close to it is uh, on a racetrack. And uh, people will pledge both money to a charity based on the performance of that race car, be it virtual with your thumbs or, or a real one. And Heather is involved in those things. So just that one morning and afternoon with Robert Wise and the confidence that Ted had in me that I'd done some things, but this would be another challenge, uh, has affected me profoundly and, and uh, what we have is an iMastery Academy now, that, or Institute that we're starting, which stands for Interactive Media Arts and Sciences Training, Education, and Retirement for You. And a couple years ago, uh, uh, and last year uh, uh, caught a couple of uh, vicious COVIDs and sort of stalled us out, but we were contacting Ed Asner, who had put together the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA uh, together uh, into one union, and it had a health plan that was uh, paid for initially and set up quickly by all of the actors turning over their post-1960 residuals to the union for a health uh, a plan for the members. And all these years later, they're now like 85 and, and, and or, uh, in retirement home there. And the health plan wanted rigid installment payments and told them they had to earn not just 12000 but $25,000 a year to maintain their union uh, dues and pay for this health plan. I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of 85 years old uh, broke actors who are elderly that, you know, make that much off of gigs. So there's a time when money's supposed to come back to you. So uh, anyway, we were contacting with him and that too came back to this conversation uh, of encouragement by Robert Wise that I'm solving his problem. He's, he's given me advice to solve a lot of people's problems and I'm the next generation to carry it out. So that's what we're doing and uh, um, Interactive TV will displace, uh, disrupt uh, one-way TV. And we're welcoming all opinions and we're empowering the audience with technology to rate, label, filter, warn. Parents can filter out 23 different kinds of, of uh, verbal or visual violence or uh, sex or whatever they don't like. And um, can phone vote on a topic and a second phone vote if somebody uh, uh, wants to pass a law or a subsidy for such a topic and separates those issues out. But uh, all of these things went back to uh, 1976 to 1984 and the people that Ted Danieleski uh, put me with. And I think back on the influence of uh, these diverse individuals like uh, Walter Matthau, Jack Lemmon, Robert Wise, Arch Mads, and many others that Ted uh, put us with and sometimes one to one. And that's an important part of uh, the creative industry. And uh, I think we can all make it better with uh, Ernie here, who's a study of symbols.